Uh, welcome everyone to Investing for Generational Wealth. Let's dive into the world of expert financial insights and strategies. Um, before we begin, as always, quick disclaimer, we're not financial advisors. All investments are subject to risk, including the possible loss of the money invest. So perform your due diligence before making any financial decisions. And of course, consult your CPA and or attorney before making any investments. I'm your host today, John Lai, and welcome to today's episode, Choosing a Market. Uh, so today's guest, is George Roberts III. George boasts a dynamic journey from acclaimed data scientist and bioscientist to a pioneering figure in commercial real estate. So he has a distinguished career marking, uh, marked, over, uh, marked by over 700 citations in genomics, mi microbiology, physiology. George's transition from Lapico to the boardroom was driven by a desire to explore the thrilling world of entrepreneurship. He's renowned as the data scientist of real estate. So he injects enthusiasm into Housing economics, macroeconomics, and finance through his engaging YouTube channel, which you have to link to uh, for us later. So he currently serves as the principal at Roberts uh, Capital Enterprises, and he spearheads the sponsorship of uh, value-add multifamily opportunities and caters to passive investors um, with over 380 units under active investment and a portfolio of um, 547 multifamily units. He has a commitment to uh, be an active and an uh, avid passive investor. So with that, George, um, I gave a little bit of background on you, but if you could give a little bit more about your experience, how you got to where you are, and um, provide uh, some more detail on that, that'd be great. Over to you. Absolutely. Well, uh, my whole career has been a search for more and more freedom. I went from a bioscientist where, uh, as you might know, there's not a whole lot of freedom. You work very long hours for very little money and uh, thought that I'd really made the big time becoming a data scientist. Uh, just love FinTech because I was an investor and it seemed like just the place to be. I understood numbers, had an advanced degree in computer science and figured this would be the place to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, well, along the way, my sister came to me and said, let's start a construction company. So it really all just came together. You know, the the investment side, the numbers, and the entrepreneurship. And at that point, it became clear. You know, the thing for me to do, uh, you know, that was really my sister's gig. It was her idea. Uh, she and my brother-in-law are running the company that I needed my own thing. And I knew how to be I, I knew how to be a landlord. And so the only thing to do was to go back and now let's be a landlord at scale. So that's the sort of data science take on it. Why not just uh, go do the same thing you know how to do, but scale it. And there's probably no business that scales more easily than multifamily. If you know how to run an apartment of 10 units, not terribly different to take on a hundred. And then you take on 10 of them. Next thing you know, you got a thousand units under management. So uh, that was the idea. Just search for freedom, uh, found it in a place that I didn't expect to, and just loved every step of the way. Hmm, that's great. Um, now, um, did you start, as most investors do, start with the uh, you know single family, then to a duplex or triplex, and then jump you know eventually to multifamily? Well, to a degree I did. I mean, I had a single family home investment for Oh, gosh, that takes me back to 2010. So you could say that I've been a landlord for over a dozen years. Uh, it was the depths of the Great Recession. My dad said, hey, you would understand that it doesn't make any sense to sell the home now. But moving up makes a big, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, it was a little frightening to not have all that equity. Uh, it would have made things a whole lot easier, but couldn't have made a whole lot of money on the sale at the time. So it was it was the perfect idea. And again, it wasn't the sort of thing that I was thinking. I was trained to to be a technical guy. And you really have to keep the nose to the grindstone. You know exactly what I'm talking about, John. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, sometimes you need a little push from outside. And that was very helpful to me. But I'll tell you the thing uh, that I didn't do was treat it like a business. And so even back to maybe 2018, that's when I started the long road of, of education. 2016, uh, launched the company with my sister. 
uh, thought that was going to be the be all end all, right? I mean, already got what a six figure job. I uh, got a side gig that could produce uh, who knows uh, seven figures of revenue before long, and it did. Uh, but then uh, realizing that I kind of had to take two steps or one step back to go two steps forward, and the idea was, you know, go figure out what else makes sense. So I used the old data science brain to say. Uh, to take a survey of the entire investment world. There's so many things, right? There's private equity. You can invest in early stage companies. Uh, I mean, if you work hard enough at it, uh, you know, somebody like Buffett was able to make, you know, 40, 50% uh, many of the years, uh, you know, the late 50s. So uh, there's many ways to do it. You can't say there's one way to go, but uh, I found multifamily and I like to call it the gateway drug mm -hmm. to commercial real estate because really it is the easiest thing. I mean, whether you are currently uh, an owner or you rent, you know something about real estate. You understand a little bit about the need for housing. It's not like going out and buying a single tenant industrial property. Right, 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 right. Um, would, you, would you consider other than multifamily? So a lot of... Uh, a lot of people uh, consider industrial or consider self-storage or other type of, at least um, uh, you know, diversifying into other commercial real estate asset classes. Well, I think all those are great ideas and I wouldn't discourage anyone from going into any one of those. I think they're all good, but uh, I like to use the example of single tenant industrial because that's something that obviously doesn't make a whole lot of sense as you, on your first time out. So first time out, you don't want to have a single tenant. And I think industrial is a little bit difficult yeah. uh, to sort of uh, wrap your brain around. Uh, I mean, again, it's it's just different uh, than, than what that which we deal with every day. But something like self-storage, no reason why you couldn't do that the first time out. RV park or uh, a trailer park many things you could do your first time out in commercial real estate. I mean, the main thing, as everybody knows, you just got to, uh, you got to pick, you got to pick your lane and stay in it. So for me, it made a lot of sense. I mean, I've given, I've given talks uh, at summits about diversification. I'm actually writing a book right now. I hope to, uh, to release it soon. It's going to be uh, passionate living through passive investing. So I give you the entire survey. In many ways, it's autobiographical because I did many of these things and still do. Private equity, early stage investments, uh, angel investments, et cetera. Uh, I have invested in other types of commercial real estate and I'll continue to do so. Makes makes a lot of sense. So uh, pick pick your start. Multifamily is a good one, but you don't have to stay there. Got it. Okay. Um, so this session is about choosing your market. Uh, you live in the Michigan area. Midwest is a great market to to invest in. Do you um, can you describe your uh, buy box and your current portfolio today? Absolutely. So, uh, current buy box. I like places that are growing. So in the past, that's really been the southeast. Sort of moved towards the middle band of the country because you can see that. Well, first apartment I ever bought was in Orlando. And wow, uh, you know, just as I thought that South Florida was crazy in 2020 when I moved into multifamily, and how whew, Central Florida is looking mighty crazy. So, uh, you know, I had a choice, you know, well, I could just try to move into Northern Florida. But I mean, I can kind of see that maybe um, I don't want to say the jig is up because people are still moving to Florida and I would still definitely consider investments in Florida, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, considered investments in Kentucky, uh, East Tennessee, et cetera. These are some great places. But from there, uh, not only did I expand my markets, I really like Cincinnati, although I've never invested there. I've invested twice in Kansas City, for example. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of places that are growing. I've worked really hard to identify the emerging markets, but you asked for the buy box. So I started with the geography. Uh, I like smaller deals. It makes a lot of sense to me because right now we've seen a lot of interest rate volatility. We think interest rates are going down, but you know, John, it's not hundred percent. We saw two runs of inflation in the 1970s and to kill it, uh, the second round of rate hikes was much fiercer than the first. So even though we think uh, we're, at, we're on the downhill side of this slope, we don't know. And it makes sense to me to go places where you can get seller financing. I mean, I've got deals uh, either through assumption or because of seller financing, you know, three and a half percent, four percent. 
I mean, uh, who is that their portfolio other than people who have been at this, uh, in most cases, much longer than I. So I like smaller deals. And I would say, you know, maybe 10 to 100 units. That's one of the things I like. But everybody seems to talk about units. But it's kind of a meaningless thing. We had to look at this in terms of finance. 10 units in San Francisco is a lot different than, than uh, 10 units in Detroit or even 30 or 50. Right. Uh, you know, the per unit price, the cash flow is going to differ hugely in between markets. So again, you know, when people, uh, I, one of the things I like to do, I'm a mentor, okay? I help people understand uh, what it takes to get into the business. I can do things like sign a loan, et cetera. And when people bring me a loan uh, or bring me a deal, I say, well, you know, what kind of a loan are we gonna get? Uh, bank doesn't care how many units. Uh, what we care about is whether the loan size is going to be over a million. And in that case, maybe we can go for agency financing. So I really like deals where uh, we're going to finance at least a million dollars of debt, or in the worst case, that after we're done with renovations, know that we have uh, an opportunity to bridge to that. So again, I like to think in terms of, of millions of dollars rather than um, numbers of units, but I would say 10 to 100 is pretty, pretty decent. I like 70s or more recent. I've gone outside the box, but, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a good guideline. You just have different problems with older buildings. Yeah. Uh, even 1970s, uh, you know, my friends who started out a few years with me uh, back, they, they were buying in the 70s. Now I've got a buddy who says 80s or sooner, you know, you got to update from time to time. But um, I like to cast a little bit wider of a net. I don't mind if there's a mansard roof. I don't care if it was built in 1970. Uh, but if you give me something, you come bring me something from 1950, I'm going to feel a lot stronger about it because there's just a lot more dispersion around the estimate of what that property is worth. Got it. Okay. That's, there's a lot of great information in what you just uh, imparted. Okay. Um, so one question I uh, typically get is um, do the markets change? So like, you know, uh, and I think the answer is yes, but what have you seen in market? You started with the, you know, um, Florida, South Southeast Florida, as you said, the, the mid, and, and then kind of starting to migrate toward the Midwest. Um, how has that changed over time? And um, does it have to, is it related to migration, population migration? And is it related to economics? Is it related to uh, the business environment? Oh yeah, all the above. For a long time, we've been able to just look at things in terms of migration. And when everything was going up, the places that were getting in migration were going up. Now we saw interest rates go up. And one of the questions we have to ask is where are we in the real estate cycle? Well, it's different in every market. And a lot of markets are overbought. Some of them are getting overbuilt, although our country is way underbuilt. Uh, we have certain areas that are starting to get overbuilt. So it's not enough, I would say, to go by what we've done in the past. So to your list, which is a good one, I would add how overbought is the market uh, or how overheated is it? Because, uh, you know, it's like the old adage, you know, if it, you know, some, some places are just too hot to touch. Right, right. It's like the stove. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we're starting to look at uh, parts of Texas. And as much as Austin, for example, was overbought uh, maybe a year ago, it's starting to, you know, come to the trough and come back up. So I definitely agree with that that sentiment. Um, um, other markets, uh, what other considerations, you know, because this is a, a webinar on markets, what other considerations do you have as you think about um, the, the, the change in the different markets uh, sticking with multifamily, um, for someone that's just starting out, where do you think they should look and how do you think they should go about it? Well, I would say the first thing is do pick a market, okay? To be very clear about that. I mean, some people will just say, you know, hey, I'll cast the widest net possible. In terms of units, maybe. Uh, you you got to have an idea of what you're looking for. Like I was looking for deals 100 or over. First deal was 14. When it fell in my lap, I didn't say that's outside my buy box. We did some very careful underwriting and it made sense. So uh, the first thing is you have to narrow it down. And that's that's obvious to people who have been in the business, but I know that there are probably a lot of people listening right now looking for that first deal saying like, well, I have two or three top markets. Okay, you probably do better if you narrow it down to one. Right. Uh, the second thing is, is you know, you got to understand real estate's hyper-local. I mean, I like Orlando. I, I did, and I still do. Uh, I like the I-4 corridor, 
which is running essentially from Daytona to Tampa. Okay. Uh, I like between Orlando and Tampa a lot more than I like the Eastern half, but you got to get really very granular. You got to know your neighborhoods. So you want to first decide what city you want to invest in. Do simple things like a population search, go to city data, find out what are the, uh, the salaries in the area, because you're gonna have different, different problems in different areas. Understand that the cost of living matters. Like for example, if you're in East Tennessee, for example, and uh, you know 50,000 median income there means a lot different than it means in, in Miami or San Francisco. So uh, t- take a careful look at things like uh, rent constraints. Uh, you don't want people to be uh, income constrained. And that was more of a problem when we had inflation going up like nuts. Rents were going up like crazy and uh, salaries weren't. Now salaries are starting to exceed rent growth. And that's important. We need that. But it's going to be a long time before you see a large margin of error in many of these markets. But there are many markets. Uh, I think many markets, for example, in Kentucky or particularly East Tennessee, that that make a big uh, really uh, make a difference. But I would get back to like, know, know your neighborhood. I mean, go to Neighborhood Scout. What does the crime look look like? And uh, look at those heat maps. Really, really know the area. Because if you say, hey, I'm interested in Kansas City. Okay. A lot of great things about Kansas City. Major rail hub. Second to Chicago. Uh, it, it's known for its, uh, it's two, over 200 fountains. Uh, it's known for barbecue, jazz. You got two uh, great sports teams. It, it's a great place to live. And you have to think, you know, hey, uh, other people are not so different than me. Um, they wouldn't mind having a major sports team in town, having all that culture. Uh, people are moving out there. It makes sense. You see the rents out there moving up and they've got room to move up because it's not as rent constrained, or I'm sorry, I should say, uh, you know, income constrained as, as other places. When you see pe- rents getting close to that 30% mark on average, then uh, really the only way you can outperform is to expect that salaries are going to go up. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned a couple of great sites there, City Data and others. Um, what other resources do you, do you use? Yeah. So, yeah, first of all, let me clarify city-data.com if you're listening. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Google. Oh, my goodness. You get the population. Uh, I think there are some more off the beaten path things you can do. Um, like, first of all, I don't see everybody who gets a deal actually get the CoStar report, right. do it, right? I mean, there's somebody involved in the deal that has a vested interest in seeing this thing go through, and that person will give you a CoStar report. Whether you've got a loan broker or whether there is a real estate broker involved in the deal, somebody will. you got a friend who's a commercial real estate broker, uh, maybe they'll do it for a price. Uh, you know, I've heard, you know, some people print it out for a couple hundred dollars. It's cheap because it'll give you things like the absorption rate. You wanna know uh, what's the absorption over the last 12 months. And you also want to know uh, what sort of construction is coming online. But here's some other things even more off the beaten path. And I like small towns. So you want, if you wanna expand on the buy box, uh, you know, looking for a great deal is a lot like looking for investors. I've heard that it's, it's like turning over rocks, right? Like the bird has to turn over a lot of rocks to find that worm. Well. Uh, you want to turn over the rocks in a place where you don't have a whole lot of other birds turning over rocks. So go uh, out into the tertiary markets. Everybody wants to be in the big city, whatever, however you define that. Everybody wants to be in the main market. So if you can find a tertiary market that makes sense to you, it's probably not as picked over. Not only are you more likely to find a good deal, you're more likely to find a mom and pop seller who's had it for 30 years, who's going to give you seller financing. Uh, You're more likely to find a place that has rents that are already $200 uh, below market. You might find that the tenants are already on month to month leases. You can come in and do whatever you want. You can raise the rents or you can kick them out and you can uh, perform renovations. Uh, and, and if you've got that uh, seller financing, you don't have to worry about keeping 90% occupancy. All you got to do is keep uh, you know, 1.00 DSCR, uh, not having covenants, not having to show your accounting every quarter, 
a thousand reasons why I like these tertiary markets and and the uh, the mom and pop sellers that that you find there, but also look for uh, an emerging market. So a couple of years back, or even three, four years ago, I would say. Uh, Cincinnati is an emerging market. Maybe a couple of years ago, I would say Kansas City. Now I hear Kansas City all the time. People are always talking about Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, some that are maybe a little bit more off the beaten path, uh, get just a little bit outside of Phoenix. You'll find a place called Buckeye. Hmm. Buckeye is right on the edge of desert on one side, out to the west, and Phoenix out to the east. And it's one of the places that's growing the fastest. And yet it's not too expensive yet. Uh, whereas Phoenix has uh, taken a major hit recently in terms of prices. It's coming back up, but uh, we had some issues there. Uh, you know, Buckeye is a place that I think is a lot more interesting. Uh, if you, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, you asked uh, about where to go for data. And uh, let's get back to that. So, Fred, Fred is amazing. Uh, fred.stlouisfed.org. You can find everything there. It's an aggregator. The St. Louis Fed has done the world a great service to take everything from case filler to, uh, to their own data, to FHFA, uh, whether you're looking for uh, data on multifamily, single family, or just want to understand macroeconomics in general, Fred probably has at least part of the answer you're looking for. So go out to Fred. You can see that a state like Iowa has always been uh, much smoother in its growth than, for example, Nevada or Florida. <laughs> uh, there are some places that are just, it seems, more prone to booms and busts. And some of these areas, which I hate to say it, are just in some ways more desirable or more obviously desirable like Florida, uh, they, they do boom and bust. But Iowa, apart from the, uh, the episode of the 1980s where there was a major major uh, f uh, farm bust, uh, you know, Live Aid 1985. Uh, it was you know, a real mess. Uh, it took them about, oh, I want to say it wasn't until the uh, least the late, uh, late, late 80s before things got halfway back to where they were in the late 70s. But uh, apart from that, it's been very, uh, very solid. So, so go look for a place like that. And remember, places change. If you, if you talk about a place that has a mono economy, people will probably say, hey, Houston, right? Well, not really. It used to be that way. So uh, so pay attention uh, to trends and pay attention to when things change. Right. I like that. Um, uh, do you have a listing of three, four metrics that you use as the KPIs you use to evaluate a market? Um, so if, you know, a market has X in it, you, know, you, you would not touch that market? Yeah, well, too much poverty. Uh, that's that's one thing. But again, how do you define the market? Um, you know, you don't want to define it on a census block like you'll find at City Dash Data. Okay, right. uh, you got to aggregate many uh, census blocks around you. Uh, you also have to look at the quality of the property too. So, I mean, you could say like, well, this place has got twenty percent poverty. Well, okay, that's probably not a good area. But again, are you in the uh, the path of progress? Are you in the uh, in one of the neighborhoods that's doing significantly better? What's the quality of the property? Because you're going to have an issue of poverty in an area that has, you know, five or 10% poverty if you have the worst apartment on the block. Right. And uh, depending on what you can do, I mean, it's hard to get rid of a mansard roof. You can make it a lot nicer, but it's not going to look like that 1990s or the late 80s property that has a pitched roof. It's never going to quite look like that. So you, you have to be uh, mindful of the area and you have to be mindful of the property you're working with. So I would say too much poverty or a property that's just a little bit too, um, you know, too far gone. Uh, that's something that I would uh, have a real hard time touching. But number one is population growth. That, that's going to give you the biggest tailwinds because, you know, consider economics is the study of scarce resources with alternative uses. I don't care whether the new people buy. I don't care whether they rent. If they are home buyers, they're going to displace renters from single family homes. If they're renters, boom, <laughs> then uh, we're already there. So population growth makes it difficult to lose. But I mean, there are some areas like Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix, you just got a little overbought there. So it really didn't matter the fact that people continue to move there. Uh, we're seeing some damage. Uh, Florida got a little ahead of itself. Now I got in before... 
uh, before the major tailwinds, okay? I saw the tailwinds coming. I got in, I benefited. Now, does it matter that I've stagnated for a year? No, not when my first two years uh, in Florida have been so prosperous. So you gotta be careful about uh, where you think we are in the real estate cycle, which is hard to judge, very hard to judge. Uh, like, like for example, Iowa, you would have never known that there's gonna be a grain embargo and that you couldn't export. We didn't know that the US dollar would appreciate 26% between 1980 and 1984. Uh, we didn't know there was gonna be a drought in 1983. So it's very, very hard. When those sorts of things happen, knowing uh, things like absorption and uh, the, you know, new construction is not going to help you. So you, you have to always remember there, there's, there's always something uh, known as force majeure. So, so be careful, be diversified. But, uh, but yeah, those are, I just gave you one. So let's go through the others really quickly. So there's income. So uh, well, we touch on poverty. So you wanna know how much money people are making and uh, whether you're anywhere near people paying 30% of their income for rent. Don't wanna be anywhere near that. Uh, I'd rather be at a place that has 16 or 18% like Kentucky. Uh, I wanna say around last year, I checked 18% is, is the average amount that's going uh, to rent. A pla place like that, could easily see see gains for a long time. Uh, what about home prices? A place where home prices are appreciating, uh, that's the sort of rising tide that lifts all boats. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I like multifamily for the way it scales, but if it made more sense to buy a single family, I would do that. Uh, you know, at some point, if uh, single family gets too expensive, what are people going to do? They're going to be driven into apartments. So uh, seeing that you have, and again, it's all the same things that drive the desirability. I mean, tenants like the same things that homeowners do. And these are really the same people, right? We talk about tenants and homeowners like they're two different groups of people. In many cases, they're the same people at different stages of their life. Right. So uh, 100%, uh, look, look at the... Um, uh, the jobs growth, you want to look at uh, income, you definitely want to take a quick look at crime. And uh, you want to make sure that you're in an area where you don't want the areas around you to be uh, too crime heavy, but you'd probably like to be in an area that's nice and getting better. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, what do you think about the, not necessarily the political environment, the politic, politics aside, but landlord friendly versus not landlord friendly, is that a consideration? Oh, absolutely. It's a consideration. But I would say that the first rule of real estate that I found is, you know, ask yourself, where are people making money in real estate? The answer is everywhere. Yeah. I'm not telling you to go out and just pick any old market or to invest someplace just because it's your backyard. But don't give up the home field advantage for nothing. Okay. Uh, your home field is all things equal, the best place to invest. Well, all things are never equal. But, uh, but go ahead, take a close look at your backyard. And uh, when, when you do go out there and, and invest, you know, ju just remember that uh, it, it's not as, not as easy as that. Like for example, Kentucky, you know, if you ask people, you know, is Kentucky uh, landlord friendly? People would probably say, oh yeah, hey, real estate, you know, whatever. And I will try to leave the politics aside as much as possible, but is it landlord friendly? I mean, look what they did to people with, uh, through COVID. I mean, they were just blindsiding the landlords uh, time and time again with uh, what they were allowing the tenants to get away with. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think politics and policy are a little different. So uh, I'm not going to, you know, get into the politics of it, but the policy of letting tenants get away with murder just puts them so far behind that you have to evict them. Mm -hmm. And now they got an eviction. And what landlord wants to, uh, to to rent to them? Now it may be the case that, but for the um, the pandemic, that they wouldn't have behaved that way. Well, sorry, uh, you know your uh, your next landlord doesn't know that for certain. They're just going to see, hey, you've been evicted. I don't want to deal with you. So, uh, cause a lot of trouble. So, yes, I like uh, landlord friendly states, but uh, choose carefully. Don't think that it's quite as easy as it may seem. Uh, dig a little deeper. <laughs> I like that. I like that advice. Um, so uh, as a investor, I've selected a market. I've selected micro, maybe the micro markets, looked at the KPIs. I've narrowed it down. Now I'm ready to maybe dig deeper. Um, I'd be interested to know, uh, do you work with a, a broker? Do you work with a syndicator? Do you, you know, who do you work with to find that investment? 
So I'll tell you what, uh, one of the things that's vastly overlooked in any type of investing is what is your personality? So it's good to work with brokers. It's good to work direct to seller. Uh, and it's also good to work with uh, newer investors, call them students, mentees. Uh, for me, the, the latter is the best. So there are people, people who say like, oh, I just want the biggest deals. I work only with brokers. Great. There are people who don't mind rejection and who are very creative in how they send out direct to seller. So I think all too often we have. Hey, George, I think uh, your mic went out for some reason. Uh, yep, I still can't. Test one, two, test one, two. Uh, yep, you're back. Okay, yeah, sorry. Let me see if I can recreate where we're at. I know how it is. I have no idea. It still showed the levels on my side, but okay, um, okay yeah. So uh, what, what exactly were we talking about? Uh, uh, we're talking about working with brokers versus- uh, Yes, yes, working with brokers is a great way to go. But but again, uh, what I would say is a sort of credentialist bias from our educational system. Like, I'm smart enough to do this. Who cares how smart you are? Do you like- do you like it? Because you aren't going to get five steps down the road before you find out, I don't like working with brokers, or I don't like working direct to seller, or right. I can't stand mentoring people. So, uh, you know, make sure that what you're doing uh, fits your personality and be ready to pivot. Now, for me, I've got a weekly call. I just connect people naturally. So every week, uh, you know, 25, 30, 40 investors get on my call. I uh, always have two, three, four, sometimes five or six new investors. I meet people all the time. I take notes. And if somebody says, you know, I've got a deal in Peoria, Illinois, I know people that are out there. I'll tell you, well, here, this is who you might want for boots on the ground. And that investor who might've been new six or 12 or 18 months ago, I'll call them up. And, uh, you know, they might have, uh, you know, 300 units at this point, who knows? So uh, for me, that's why mentoring people and helping people makes the most sense because I mean, I'm an award-winning data scientist. Before this, I was in genomics, right? Which is one of the more numbers heavy parts of biology. Oh, I can handle numbers, but I would rather deal with people. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you, you entered this journey looking for passive investments, passive uh, income. Um, would you say that for the person that is looking for that passive uh, stream of income, uh, what's the best approach versus active? Like you can take a pretty active role, right? As a syndicator, as a GP, whatever it is, uh, or you could take a pretty passive role. Um, what would you say? Uh, have you have you gotten to that passive stage of <laughs> your invest, your real estate investment journey? Well, a couple of things I would say about that. So I've got a chapter in my book, passive investing is a lie. <laughs> right, because people will tell you, "Oh, multifamily, hey, it's passive. You get this, uh, you know, uh, you get this uh, property manager, and you know, you're just the asset manager, and you just raise capital, and then you get a new deal." And like, well, I don't know. Maybe it was like that at one point, like 2011, where everything was going straight up like a rocket. Yeah. But uh, but even back then, there there was work involved, and you've got to run a whole lot more deals these days. So I don't think it was ever true can't run anything yeah. with it. it's active by definition so 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 no active role uh, at all it, you know, but but even within active investing is it a heavy lift are we talking about redevelopment mm -hmm. okay first of all are we talking about ground up development are we talking about redevelopment are we talking about a major reposition are we talking about an operations play or are we talking about something that's fully stabilized and you just think you can run it better than the current owner okay all of these have a different level. So what I would say is, is that just, just as I say, you gotta understand your personality. It's not about what you're smart enough to accomplish. It's about understanding your personality and picking the right investment for you. What is the right deal of activity for you? Because maybe you just like raising capital. So you can, uh, you can become a broker dealer rep, perfect. Or maybe you can uh, you know, establish some fund of funds and invest in someone else's investment. Right. You know, all of these have their own, uh, they've got their own overhead, they've got their own degree of uh, activity, but you might be in a situation where after the deal closes, you don't have to do anything. You know, also what's your age? 
Like, what if your goal is to retire at 60 and you're 55? Uh, sure, you might be able to do one last round of asset management. Uh, but I've seen people go from, hey, I know how to asset manage and raise capital, but you know what? I'm done asset managing. I'm going to make a fund of funds and, and I'm going to let somebody else handle that. So, uh, so even with an active investing, but passive investing as well. So you want to be a passive investor. Uh, what do you want to look for? Well, you want some very stabilized deals in markets that have decent tailwinds. Uh, but again, you know, don't be too greedy. If you want to invest in a place that has great tailwinds, those are also the markets that are most likely to suffer a reversal. So are you willing to invest in solid middle of the road deals, be very picky, invest only in deals that have agency funding and which are expected to cash flow right away? Do you know how to ask the right questions? Well, then, yes, you can get to that passive level uh, a lot earlier. But again, I look at it as like a lever, okay? I am working really hard to grow my wealth right now uh, for many reasons. I'm still, I consider myself young. I still enjoy the work. And I feel that I'm setting a good example for my children. I mean, I mean, I could, you know, potentially retire. My my wife is a full-time mother. So there's not a there's not a great draw in that direction to say that, well, you know, I've got a full-time parent. Well, I don't have to. You know, I, I feel I'm setting a good example by being uh, active to a certain degree, but also showing the kids that there are limits. So uh, I guess there's a lot wrapped up in there. There's uh, investment uh, thesis, there's uh, personality, and then there's also the personal goals. So, but I'm, I'm moving it back. I am becoming more of a passive investor. And at some point it's going to be a question of, you know, getting more, pick, more and more picky about deals, uh, picking only the ones that are cash flowing earlier. And, uh, and at some point it's going to be that, you know, Hey, I would rather give my money to operator X because I'm going to spend this time with a family. Right. That's great. great. I'm, I'm um, kind of in the same boat as you. So I can definitely empathize with that. Um, so you're a data scientist, uh, you're a scientist, and, uh, there's a lot of data out there on where the market is going as well as, um, specifically talking about interest rates. So any predictions on, uh, and I hate to ask people this, but um, how the interest rates are going to move and how that's going to affect the market? Right, well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, you're speaking to a man who used to make predictions for a living. Actually, I do a little freelance work as a data scientist, so I guess you could say I still make predictions for a living, but uh, the, the best thing to do with interest rates and making predictions is just don't. Uh, because we don't know. And, and I think that keeping a healthy degree of uh, scatter around uh, your, your best point estimate is, is a good idea. Uh, I do think that interest rates are going down. I think that that's going to cause the market to go up insanely. I mean, take a look at our undersupply. I mean, the only reason the market didn't crash with the quickest interest rate increase in history is that we are vastly undersupplied. Well, guess what happened? Now uh, we have the rumblings of recession. Uh, we have builders already getting out of the game because banks are picky. Mm -hmm. And we don't see the sort of building activity that we thought we were gonna see. I mean, all of a sudden we thought, you know, hey, we've got all the leading indicators showing us that we're gonna have 2 million homes built a year. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, things changed really quickly when those interest rates went up. And now uh, the leading indicators, as well as our completions, are down. So we're, we're just simply not going to resupply. No, that's great. Um, any lasting thoughts um, as, as we close out the conversation? And how do we, how do people uh, that are interested to find out more information about you and potentially your book when, whenever? Um, Tell the audience. Well, I'm going to go travel for the rest of the month of March. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it may not be the best time for me to finish it up, but I, I think I'm in the finishing stages. I'm going to go into developmental editing mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some great readers. I, I've been through a few drafts and I, I, I've written about active investing uh, as well, but I decided to, to shelve that and come back to this project. So uh, I'm pretty familiar with how the process goes and uh, it shouldn't be too, too much longer, but really ready to get some eyes on it and then hopefully get it out uh, definitely this year, hopefully <laughs> closer to the middle in the end. But, uh, you know, in terms of closing thoughts, 
choosing your market, it's, it's very important. It's going to decide whether you have tailwinds or whether you're going to be forced to swim upstream. It's going to determine whether it's easy for you to evaluate a deal or hard. If you know all the neighborhoods, you already know when the broker sends you a deal. Sorry, we're not interested in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's going to be a whole, you're going to, you're going to find that first deal a whole lot faster. Uh, but, but also, um, you know, cho- choosing that market, again, it's, it's going to help you uh, to, to orient yourself. It's going to be like rolling downhill. Um, so so uh, when I evaluate a deal, the first thing I do, I look at the market, the submarket. I look at the neighborhood because why would I want to put a hundred numbers into a spreadsheet, all of which need to be verified for the spreadsheet to have any validity. If I don't know that I like the neighborhood, right. Google map it, um, ask your friends in the area. Uh, you know, what are your notes? You should have notes on, you'd have an opinion, at least a cursory opinion of every neighborhood uh, in your favorite market. So just, triage always triage yeah. because you you might have to look at 300 deals to find one okay how quickly can you eliminate 250 and then you put the energy into those 50 because somebody who puts a lot of energy into 50 decently likely is going to do a lot better than somebody who scatter shot 200 yeah Great closing thoughts. Um, Thanks for your conversation, George. This has been a fabulous conversation this hour. Learn more about choosing a market and potentially when George is going to come out with his book, uh, hopefully sometime soon, uh, feel free to reach out to George. Uh, Is your email the best uh, way to reach out to you, George? Uh, Sure, yeah, you could uh, could reach out to me through email, but the easiest way to get at that is just come to uh, robertscapitalenterprises.com. Best way to come find me, but I'm also on YouTube as the data scientist of real estate and I'm all over LinkedIn. Send me a message. So we'll include his contact information in the description for the podcast episode as well. Thanks for educating us on choosing a market. Uh, Tons of great information. Again, thank you, George, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to speak to our audience. Uh, Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast on whichever platform you're listening to and to make sure that we can continue bringing you the best educational content. Thanks, everyone. And until next time, keep learning to invest for generational wealth. Thanks, George. All right. Thank you so much, John. It's been a great pleasure.